the edge the poverty or the building wealth and abject poverty community situation is that we don't really look at the real facts. We reduce the footprint and that's what that meeting over there is about. The community proposal is about making this sacred ground, all of this sacred ground, something that can reflect the true diversity of what is happening good in the city of Richmond. But we have this thing about starting small and then the small does not add up to what the larger community needs to have happen. So the city of Richmond is 220,000 people. Public housing is 4,100 units. I sat on the Anti-Poverty Commission where we were trying to figure out how to build wealth in abject poverty communities and start small, all that little narrative stuff that's really not really solving the problem. So if you take the 26% that caused the Anti-Poverty Commission to be formulated, because when you're trying to get money on the national level, the debt ratio cannot be above 20 some percent, and they are not going to issue any bonds and stuff like that in order for real development to be done. So they are using minimum standards in order to try to piecemeal the redevelopment. But the redevelopment is breaking up family lives and because public housing was started in Richmond in the 40s and actually if you just really go to how Virginia period you know what Kansas was saying about the preschool to prison pipeline you know Virginia was the second slave trading area next to New Orleans but what Virginia did was they stopped importing slaves and started breeding slaves so we have one of the most heinous processes of dehumanizing human beings in this particular geography. So when they wanted to put the stadium on top of the African ancestors, they want to bury this. They don't want to have any truth and reconciliation. And that's Lilla Estes talking there. That's my belief. So going back to how we look at the numbers, you know, Richmond by the numbers, we need to look at what those numbers really reflect. And I've said on occasion a couple of different times when I was at VCU, uh, Amiri Baraka came there and he made this comment about, you know, if a cat have kittens in the oven, do it make them biscuits? You know, so anything in, a, in, in, in the oven you cook, you know, it's going to make it food. You know, but we're letting people determine who our enemies are and who our enemies are not. So I'm going to go back to this computation real quick because I want us to really get that. 220,000 people make up the city of Richmond. Public housing is 4,100 units. So the poverty rate is 20, 26%. So taking the 26%, that's 57 plus thousand people by the city numbers that they say live in abject poverty. 41 fixed units in public housing is 11 point some thousand people. So bumping it up to 60,000 and 15,000 that's in public housing for ease of math. Subtract the 15 from the 60 and you have 40 plus thousand people by the city numbers and the definition of who actually live in public housing that do not, uh, that are in the poverty category that do not live in public housing. And this is information that we really need to start addressing to our city council people and our school board people because they are not giving us the accurate factual information. So starting in public housing with redevelopment you know, it's not solving the problem. It's 100% it's decimation of the poor. So I wanted to just really drop that information with you all and hope that as we go forward, we can have the real conversation about what's actually happening in our community. Thank you very much. Also, we can see that it's time to rain. We can back up under the tunnel. We can keep going because the next person I want to call is Mr. Marty Jewel. His subject is take down those statues. Take them down. Good, good evening, my beloved. Lord, I ain't walked this this much in 40 years. <laughs> uh, Y'all are real warriors to come out here tonight. Just as warriors as that. And Lord knows we need you. 
Uh, I served eight years, three terms on Richmond City Council, and I've never seen a more neglectful group of people in my life as what we have today. Not one council person has come out in support of the school remodernization referendum. Not one council person. Thank you, Dollar. We've been voting Democrats for decades. Not one Democrat has come out in support of fixing our school for our children. Wow. Wow. Delegate Lopasi, a Republican, has passionately committed to carry our referendum through the General Assembly. <laughs> Can I back up? I say all that to say, I say all that, to, I'm a red hot popper here. I say all that to say that those statues are symbols of white supremacy yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. And the conditions that really speak of the poverty, uh, the school, the decrepit school building, they are all the handiwork of the mindset who worship those symbols. And we need to get this because that's why we are so passionate about getting about getting rid of it. The, the fact of the matter is. If, if we don't fight, and I can tell you, black people, black people have got nothing in this country of value that we didn't have to fight for. That's right. That's right. And, and to see my white friends out here fighting with us is a thing of beauty. Yeah. Uh, we can fix this because politicians listen to only two voices. Voices with money and lots of it and voices of groups who vote. Y'all are the warriors that can fix what's wrong with Richmond. And I believe we can do it starting tonight. Thank you, God bless you. All right, all right. We're going to ask the representative from 15. Five fifteen, would you please come over? Yes, five fifteen. that's right. Woo. Woo. That's right. Give us that one. Hey, first giving honor and all glory to God for allowing us to march down here and be here today. I'm Jacqueline. Um, how y'all doing today? I'm from Fight for 15. I am a leader. Um, and many of you have heard my story many times before. Um, tonight at this march for accountability, I want to read you some facts about why the minimum wage needs to be raised, why racial justice must happen now, and why every worker, no matter what job they work, deserves union rights. <laughs> Number one, black and brown people, people of all colors, LGBT, Help companies like McDonald's make billions of dollars every year. But these powerful corporations don't pay us enough to sustain our families. Uh -huh. So more than half of black workers in America are paid less than $15 an hour. Nearly 60% of Latino workers are paid less than $15 an hour. Discrimination against women of color at the workplace is especially harsh. Latinos make only 54% as much as white men. And black women make only 63% as much as white men. Our fight for 15 an hour and the union rights has a deep bond with the movement for black lives. White supremacy and corporate greed have always been linked in America. Our movement for economic and racial justice are committed to breaking down these barriers that hold us back. And last but not least, because my life matters. My work matters. And my story matters. America was built by slaves. Workers forced to 
give all they had to create something prosperous and beautiful that they will never get to sharing. Now, hundreds of years later, working people are still forced to the bottom while corporations and CEOs build their profits on our backs. And we sick of it. We will not be silent while white supremacists and billionaires claim the country we built ourselves and our families. We will not be silent while black and brown people are executed in the streets by those swarming to protect them. We will not be silent while the few of the top sell off our government, our natural resources, and our time for personal gain. We will not back down. I believe that we will win. 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 What do we want? What do we want it? Now. What do we want? What do we want it? Now. If we don't get it, shut it down. If we don't get it, shut it down. If we don't get it, shut it down. system because we believe the civil war never ended 
and we believe the plantation system is still alive and well, and all you got to do is look around in this city. There's footprints of it everywhere. It's in the schools, as someone said before. It's when ICE has these incursions, incursions into immigrant communities on the south side. It's when police stop and frisk people. It's when the police don't give a shit what happens to people in public housing. Mm -hmm. And it's when the police show up for a very like small marching on the sidewalks kind of march in high numbers, ready to crack skulls if anyone steps out of line or even steps on those monuments. Why do you think they protect those monuments? Thank you. So I just want to say, final words, is that everyone that is in charge of enforcing these laws, keeping people from making a living wage, keeping people locked up in prison, they all have names, phone numbers, addresses, and badges that they wear. And we can do something about it if we just stick together. It wasn't the cops that protected people from getting run over or helping to stop traffic. It was our bike marshals. We don't need them. We need us. And we need more of us. Thank you. Thank you. We need more of us to tell the truth. Because to tell the truth. Okay, right now, do we have anyone from the LGBT community that was supposed to speak? Don't want to leave anyone out. Okay, so what I want to do now is call up Anna. Okay, I am going to Okay, somebody's corner. Come on, come on. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see Omari. That's right. No, let me introduce Omari. Okay. Um, Omari is going to speak on expand public transit, but my, Omari is the um, leader of the leaders of the New South. I'm going to have him to speak a little bit about evaluation, give a few minutes about transit. Thank you for showing up. Amen. <laughs> Sample 
population with 44% whites, 33% blacks, and 25% of them earning over $80,000 a year. I saw statements from our transit planners saying that the transit network plan caters to suburban affluent migrants into the city. They call them choice riders. The plan is to lure these new residents to public transit so they can make the choice to leave their vehicles at home. Well, I think there's a good number of current Richmonders who don't have such choices. There are the Richmonders living in the food desert. The Richmonders without mainstream banking in their neighborhood. The Richmonders without the freedom from waste and water treatment facilities and highway fumes. They are the Richmonders whose forefathers were crammed into these segregated areas of the city, the racist redlining, and trapped in perpetual poverty. I'm still confused, so I looked a little further and I saw that the areas where coverage is being reduced are all the RHA public housing neighborhoods, the poorest of the poor. The places where the average income is $9,000 a year. This is when my confusion starts to clear up. I recently found out that there are plans to demolish all public housing in the city. They call this poverty deconcentration. I call it community destabilization. They say they will give the tenants housing choice vouchers. And what I found out is that hood data shows that people who receive housing choice vouchers, they may move to a less impoverished area initially, but over time, the majority of them take their vouchers and they move back to a transit-rich neighborhood. Now it makes sense to me. By reducing bus coverage to these areas, the neighborhood will become less attractive to the people who rely on the bus. These are the no-choice riders. This attack on transportation doesn't stop there. There's a new plan just released last week to tow cars in these same neighborhoods. If your name isn't on the lease, if you have a suspended driver's license, if you have no proof of insurance, if you have a felony, my sister Lily calls this trimming. She told me that's what they call trimming. That's when you systematically lower the quality of life for residents in a neighborhood and you force them to leave. Where will they move? These new posh developments of BCU and the investors in our city, they won't accept these housing choice vouchers. Where will they move? They want to be pushed out into the county where transit coverage is lacking. Residents will be merely be displaced to new areas of concentrated poverty with no transportation and no mobility. Stuck. We need bus coverage in this region. Frequency is for convenience. Coverage is for survival. We need for the city to make good on its pledge to reduce poverty by ensuring equitable access to jobs, food, and resources for the current riders. The current riders, the current residents of our city. We say, not only do black lives matter, but the quality of black lives matters. The quality of black lives matter. They are putting the burden on the poorest of the poor in the city. The people that have been routinely and historically damaged from all these policies and these practices in the city. The quality of black lives matters. Black lives matter. Thank you. of those 
who went through slavery, who went through being sold, who went through emancipation, who went through a reclamation of their lives, and who ended up becoming free residents of Richmond after the end of the Civil War, who lived through Reconstruction, who lived through the destruction of Reconstruction and the institution of the most virulently racist system this country has ever seen. The markers of that virulent period of racism began with that statue, the statue of Robert E. Lee, when it was put up on Monument Avenue as a real estate deal and as a symbol to the community that a system of white supremacy was back and was going to be entrenched in Richmond and Virginia society. For the next 30 years, statues went up periodically. Supposedly, they were to honor the memory of warriors from the Civil War. But the truth was is that they were put up in order to continue to mark that white supremacy was going to be the order of the day. This was the vision that the Confederacy had had all along. This was the vision that they found the moment to carry forward into the 20th century. This is a system that we are now starting to finally shred the last remnants of. But it is definitely a process. It is definitely not done as we are working to bring attention to the need to dismantle the systems that are resulting in the issues that have been articulated by each of the speakers before me. Joe Rogers, who's part of our group, and Reverend Rodney Hunter with Wesley Memorial Church and I went up to this meeting that's happening in that jewelry box of a building, the Main Street Station, because they're holding a public hearing about high-speed rail coming into Richmond, and they're trying to decide where the station is going to go and what the impacts are going to be, and they're hearing from people what they want to hear. We were prepared, and we did stand up and say that there was no way that any impact was going to happen in the footprint of this memorial park. There were many people who supported us, who were in that room, there are many people who are talking about putting that station somewhere else. But the other critical component in talking about that is the relationship between this regional transportation and the local transportation. And we have got to continue to raise this. We have got to continue to strengthen our voices in these community processes. We have got to recognize that it's our turn now to take up the mantle for the dismantling of white supremacy and we have to carry it forward every single day. We have to pay attention to the issues involving the schools. We have to pay attention to the issues involving housing. But I'm not just saying, we're standing here paying attention. We're all paying good attention today for this event, right? But we have to be at city council, we have to be at the school board meetings, and we have to be paying attention online to when these things come up. And we have to weigh in. And we have to make that noise. And we have to continue to let them know. Because it does have an impact. And right now, they paid us a lot of lip service around the Shacklebottom Memorial Park up there. A lot of lip service. They're like, oh no, we're not going to touch anything. We have got cultural resource experts who are working to make sure that we do the right thing. That we follow the Section 106 process that the archaeology has done and that nothing happens to destroy these valuable resources. But they can turn around tomorrow and change their minds if we don't stay vigilant. Vigilance on the monuments, on, on the monuments of Monument Avenue, vigilance on these issues. Each of us has to decide which one of these issues or which three or four of these issues you're going to focus on and follow and continue to do so. We have to do it until we reach victory. We have to reach victory. The most important issues are those of the people, Black Lives Matter, their black li quality of Black Lives Matter, I think was an excellent thing to say. I'm sorry if I don't know how to stop for applause, but, <laughs> <laughs> but we are here to honor 
the lives of people who gave their lives so that our lives would be better. It's really very simple. That's right. That's right. And the fact that you all took that walk all the way from Monument Avenue down here past City Hall to this spot, to Shackle Bottoms, they hear it. They know it's important. They know it matters. And they know there can be repercussions. They know the repercussions will be political. They know the repercussions could be economic. And they know that we have the ability to leverage our voices to make things happen in the community the way that they're supposed to happen. And that is something we have to do. That is something we all have to do. And we need to see more people from our communities. And we need to move this event into the community. Maybe that's what we should be doing. Maybe we should march from here to the community next time. Right? Because I know it's hard for people to come out. The bus lines are not helping. <laughs> okay. Well, I did, I thought. Okay, is everyone clear that we we expressed our opinion about, okay, I'm sorry. The high-speed rail, there is a public comment period that is still open. That ends on November 7th. So even though this was a public hearing for people to come and do it in person, they are still taking your input online. I want you to think that, I want you to understand that process is open right now. The Devil's Half Acre development process is open for input right now, and they should hear from you every time you think of it. Every time it occurs to you that you forgot to say something the last time, you should send it in again. They need to keep hearing from you. And it is very good, and a couple of people did this, including us. We told them that there was a march. We told them that there was a march for accountability, and that it was because there is a relationship between the issues in the community and the problems that they say they're trying to solve with high-speed rail as well. They actually almost invited you in. <laughs> and then they ended, right, so, okay. <laughs> so, um, so, it, so again, it's, it, the reason that you know, we emphasize this is because not only are these opportunities, but there are opportunities to connect these issues. So even if you're weighing in on Lumpkin's Jail or the Devil's Hat Baker or the burial ground or the Shackle Bottom Memorial Park, it's actually your responsibility now to link it to all of the issues that you have heard here tonight. When you weigh in on public housing, when you weigh in on transportation, and when you weigh in and go to those meetings and talk about connect all these issues together. They need to know that we know that these things are interrelated. Because believe me, when people like Eugene Trani, who used to run Virginia Commonwealth University, is up there connecting the issues, I mean, he was good. He connected the issues. He wants the train station up on the boulevard, but he connected it to all the issues. He connected it, not to education, sorry, but he did connect it to local transportation and economic development and housing. So you know they're thinking about it, and they're not thinking about it for us. They're thinking about it for their peers, right? So it is our responsibility to know that we can connect those issues on our behalf as well. And if we can do that, we can come back here next year, and we can celebrate a victory. I'm not going to predict which one it is, <laughs> but we can celebrate a victory. All of it. <laughs> All of it. And I'm going to close by reading that banner. Build the memorial park, serve the people, down with the monuments. This is the Coalition for Accountability. Yeah. I would just like to say, a lot has been said, but this is the beginning. We are asking that each one of you all take ownership of this accountability and our responsibility of holding our officials accountable. This is a coalition. And everyone that has that's here as well as others that 
ability to make changes, but they don't want to. So we have to force them. Okay, that's our responsibility. So at this time, what I want to do, I want to close out, of course, with prayer, with in a spiritual manner, however you see it. But again, we know that all things work together. Okay, all things. So I'm going to ask Dr. Hunter to come and close us up. But right before he goes, we want Letty to tell you about an event that's coming up that we want you to continue to take ownership and be involved with as well. Okay. The Community Justice Film Series, our next screening is November the 12th, and it will be on the subject matter of transportation. The event will be held on a Sunday afternoon, which is November the 12th 